Thank you everyone for joining me uh, in this moment. Um, so I put a, a, a non-exhaustive list of things that we can talk about. Uh, I am really very curious about so many issues related to young people uh, in COVID-19 because for some reason I keep imagining myself like sometimes as being like a nine-year-old and what would I do, you know, if I was nine or even younger than that? Uh, my, my niece in Brazil uh, sent me a picture of her and her daughter who is six wearing masks and the two of them in a selfie together. And I'm thinking, what's going on inside of, you know, Mary's mind? You know, the six-year-old who now has to wear this thing right for everything that she does. Uh, and so uh, I, I would like for us to think about COVID as impacting different age groups differently. I think that a five-year-old is not the same as a 12-year-old or a 19-year-old or a 25-year-old, even though in our conversations, we have referred to all of them as youth, as young people. So I'm gonna urge my panel to make you know, differentiations uh, across those age groups uh, and to concentrate a little bit about like how is information being shared between parents and their kids depending on how old those kids are. And for those of you who have actually have kids, uh, if you can give examples, it would be wonderful. And this is an invitation to everyone who is on the call uh, to come in and, and give us those examples. Uh, so what is the impact on the communication? I mean, is communication today the same as it was three months ago? I, my observation tells me that it isn't, but I wanna hear from you guys how people are uh, communicating with young people. What's the impact of sheltering in place for a young person who wants to be outside, especially, I mean, a day like this, maybe they want to be inside, but like yesterday, I certainly wanted to be outside as fast as I could, right? So how does that impact uh, very young people and not so young people? Uh, what does it mean to be in contact online with peers? Uh, I, you know, sometimes it can be a great thing, but I, I, I hear from colleagues and friends, there's a lot of exchange of like nasty things sometimes. People saying things that are hurtful, uh, going to websites they are not supposed to be going to, uh, that they are not encouraged uh, to go to. And how does the idea of pre-existing conditions work for young people? Because most of the time we talk about, you know, people who are a bit older and how their pre-existing conditions may have an impact on their lives. Uh, but a lot of young people do unfortunately have all kinds of pre-existing conditions, respiratory conditions, and they might have disabilities that make them you know, less mobile. Uh, they may have uh, all kinds of things. And one thing that I didn't put on the, on the list that I would like for us to also address, um, People have brought up here the, the, the subject of interprofessional violence, mostly in the context uh, between uh, couples, right? I mean, you know, two partners and the kind of violence that might be happening between them. But nobody really from my memory has brought up the fact that children who are usually neglected uh, and abused, I, 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 I'm pretty sure that, you know, the neglect and the abuse is not the same as it was before COVID. I'm not uh, uh, you know, assessing whether or not it's better or worse or whatever it is. I just don't know. And I would like for that to be part of the conversation as well. Uh, so as I'm winding down, I think I am going to start the conversation with Dylan, uh, who I had invited to come for when the Detroit crowd came, but he was, you know, he couldn't you know, come and join us like this. So I'm gonna go to him. Uh, and I'm gonna give, you know, I'm keeping, I'm talking so that he has a moment to collect himself to, to do his talking. And what I'm gonna ask you to do is to give the perspective that you would have a few weeks ago about the work that you are doing in Detroit and what you have been observing and pick any of those issues that I just talked about to share with us. And awesome. introduce yourself, of course, ev you know, everybody, when I call on you, introduce yourself, uh, and then speak. Cool. Thanks for inviting me. Sorry, I wasn't here for that um, for the first for the first round. Um, so I'm Dylan Cathro. For those of you uh, who I haven't had the chance to meet yet, I graduated from the MSW program um, last July, um, and then I was up until only about two and a half months ago working at the school of social work as a research coordinator for um, Matt Smith, 
on his um, prison study. And so um, I've, I'm currently working for um, 42 Ford, which is an education justice nonprofit in Detroit, um, which is about six to seven years old now. And we do a lot of organizing around different um, education issues that particularly affect Detroit schools. So for example, arbitrary closure of um, Detroit public schools, um, uh, addressing the lack of funding that our schools get in relation to private schools or even charter schools and the competition that the state has created um, through its uh, the, the weird charter system that we have here. Um, and then also thinking of ways to leverage um, community resources to impact policy. And so one of the things that the, um, the the youth collective that I work with as the director of youth organizing, one thing that they were working on before COVID started was getting a graduated income tax initiative placed on the ballot so that we um, change up the way that we tax income here so that fo folks are truly taxed in proportion to their income. And then if that were done and if that was voted on and, um, and if it passed, then the excess amount of funding that would be created from more equitable taxing um, would be directed to an education fund to create more money for um, underfunded schools. So that's some of the work we do. As the director of youth organizing, um, my job is to support the youth collective who represent about six or seven different um, organizations in Detroit. Um, so we have partner organizations. I support them Dylan, to, just make sure to tell us the ages of those young sure. people. So I work with, um, ch with uh, about 30 youth um, between the ages of 12 and 20. Um, predominantly right now, most of the, the people in our youth collective are between the ages of 12 and 18. We have some alumni that have graduated from our program and gone on to college or just post, um, post-secondary um, experiences who work with us as interns as well. And so they're between the ages of um, 19 and 21. Um, so young folks. And um, like I said, they represent um, about six or seven different organizations throughout Detroit and also Dearborn. So 482 Ford kind of serves as a hub where um, other organizations that have existing youth councils or youth groups send us two or three students from Southwest Detroit, from the east side of Detroit, north side, west side, to, to make sure that any type of policy work or any type of initiative that we're doing is representative of collective voices of Detroit students and Detroit communities. Um, so what a time to start a new job. Right uh, in, in the in the time of COVID, I I was literally um, in the office for four days, and then we went on lockdown. Right, meaning I didn't get to meet any of my youth in person. Um, we've been doing all of our our um, conversations via Zoom. So you know everything you learn in social work about creating relationships, the importance of being in person or meeting the person where they're at or whatever. It's kind of hard to do that when you have no in person contact. It's not impossible. It's working but it's difficult. Um, and so to get to the question of uh, the impact on different age groups, um, it's really interesting because we have a pretty good range of age between 12 and 18. There's a big maturity factor there. Um, and so what I'm seeing is there, there's kind of a difference in buy-in to the virus itself um, and, and its impact on our communities, particularly maybe three weeks ago, um, we went from, our, our youth went from a state of crisis and confusion to um, a sense of jadedness. You know, they were really tired of hearing about the, the virus. They're really tired of hearing the statistics or the, the conflicting information from um, various news sources. Um, and a lot, and then luckily our youth haven't been going to parties. They, they've been staying inside most of the time, um, but they have reported to us that a lot of their friends are still going out. They're still hanging out in large groups. They're still, um, kicking it with the homies on the, in the street or on the corner. And, um, and they're kind of envious to do the same, right? Um, and do, so, do they talk about if they wear masks or if they do any kind of protection? Because one thing yeah. is the physical proximity, right? Yeah, and so the big uh, problem there is access, access to PPEs, right? And so um, the, they, our youth understand, because the first week that we had our, our meetings on Zoom, I did a big presentation on what COVID is and what um, coronaviruses are and, the, and why there is a need for social distancing. And so they understand that, but there's a lot of frustration and there's a huge sense of loss, a loss of like quotidian life, a loss of um, in-person uh, contact with friends, families, and peers. Um, and and with, the, with the masks, if they have masks, they're usually wearing them. 
um, unless they forget, because as, as kids typically do, they forget to do a lot of things like homework, you know. Um, and I think um, what's been really difficult for them is one, being confined to the home. Um, a lot of our youth live in multi-generational households, which is great. It means there's a lot of wisdom in the household. It means that also means there's a lot of people that you're stuck with day in, day out. Um, and then particularly if there were already pre-existing tensions in the household, if there were already instances like Rogerio was saying of, of neglect or um, abuse or interpersonal um, violence, sometimes it's been further aggregated or aggravated um, because you're stuck in the home um, or um, in other cases, luckily the, those instances of interpersonal tension haven't necessarily gotten worse, but the, um, the toll on the mental health of our students has definitely worsened. Um, so, and so we've had a lot of folks who have been very depressed. Um, and so one of the things that I've been doing is if they're, if they're looking to receive some type of, um, third party assistance, like mental health support, um, we try to have an informed consent process of finding them some support in that way too. Dylan, I'm going to stop you there for a moment because you said something that has been in my mind for, you know, very heavily for the past mm -hmm. couple of days uh, in terms of mental health, uh, which the World Health Organization has uh, released a report, I think was yesterday or the day before, uh, clearly making sure that we understand that mental health is one of the absolutely major uh, issues that are coming about from COVID-19. So this question is not for Dylan necessarily, it's for all of my panelists. Um, but it relates to a paper that I read a couple of days ago where, uh, and I'm not sure that this is necessarily related just to young people, uh, but it, it was a paper that talked about suicide and, uh, and actually exposing oneself uh, to COVID. They, they found associations and they hypothesized and then uh, made recommendations based on this where they found that people might be uh, in some ways exposing themselves, uh, particularly to catch the virus as a way of uh, exposing themselves to, you know, to suicide. Mm -hmm. And that is related to the whole point of, you know, mental health that, that I think Dylan, you know, picked up on, uh, which is something that is, that I observed in my own research and practice for many years in terms of HIV, where many people do expose themselves to HIV, sometimes not because they want to die, but because they want housing, they want attention, they may want some services that without an HIV positive um, assessment, they would not receive. Mm -hmm. uh, so I I'm just, you know, um, bringing out, you know, some of the, the issues that, that have been coming to me. If anyone in the panel, on the panel would like to speak about that, it doesn't have to be Dylan. And that's, that's actually something that has come up with um, in conversations with, the, with um, my colleagues and, and our staff is that um, I'm not a parent, but most of the people that I work with are. And one of the things that they've been talking about with folks in my age group, particularly in like folks between 20 and 30 uh, years of age, is that um, a, lot of a lot of the folks in their communities on the east side of Detroit, west side of Detroit, have been talking about the, about the fact that they're not necessarily trying to get sick. Um, but if you want to talk about institutionalized racism and the impact that it has had on black and brown communities, um, a lot of the sentiments that a lot of the moms I work with have um, brought forth is that a lot of the young men, particularly, who are out on the street just hanging, say, the, the, you know, the system's never really care, cared about us before. If I'm going to die, I'm going to die with the homies, right? And I'm going to die with the people that have always had my back, and it's certainly not the state, right? And so, then, so you have this... Um, this kind of this camaraderie that there that a lot of folks do not want to um let go of um and so that's been a really tricky piece because you don't want to um and, and and that's kind of simulated with the our younger kids as well um not to that extent but that's something that you don't want to shame when you're trying to put forth some type of intervention or reframe right um because because to, to shame that type of need for um community would just further distance you from those kids. Thank you so much, Dylan. I'm going to go to Katie because I want to, you know, I, I have seen the eyes, you know, uh, <laughs> having reactions. Uh, do you want to, you know, introduce yourself and uh, speak to the issues that Dylan just brought up? 
Sure. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Katie Doyle, and uh, I teach in the management track. But before I came uh, back to the School of Social Work, I worked uh, with young people who are experiencing homelessness uh, and their families. And so most of my comments will be around issues related to homelessness uh, and COVID uh, and the stigma around both. Um, and I, I was uh, nodding. At, this is my best attempt at uh, engaging with you, Dylan, but I was nodding at things you were saying and my eyes were wide. But, uh, I, I think we've seen an awful lot of that with young people. Uh, the things that I was thinking about as you were talking and as you were talking, Rogerio, were the young people that I worked with, uh, the, the issues that um, led to homelessness for them are also, of course, exacerbated here in this crisis. And so, the number one issue is around family relationships and, and uh, family violence. 40% uh, um, of young people who experience homelessness uh, also identify as LGBTQ+, and many of them have been either forced out of their homes or the home has been so uh, unpleasant to live in that they have um, they've exited their homes. Uh, so interpersonal or fa family violence, um, getting thrown out, and then a uh, history of familial substance use disorder and, and family mental, um, uh, mental illness are issues that come up a lot with young people and that, that um, lead them to, to becoming homeless. And so then once you are experiencing homelessness, you need an awful lot of support and you need uh, a place to go. And so this has, of course, this crisis has, of course, um, made that, exacerbated that issue. Number one, the shelters are all still open, but it is harder to get into them. And, it, and there's a lot of fear around going to a shelter where there are, most of our, still, most of our local shelters are not able to practice full uh, physical distancing to the extent that we would like them to. By the way, when I'm talking about young people, I mostly am thinking about young people ages 10 to 25. Uh, and so some of them would, would go to an adult shelter, some would go to a youth shelter. Uh, but that, so that's a concern that people have. I think uh, a lack of, um, you know, information that is accurate. It's hard, to, it's hard enough for us to know what, what exactly is the right information. We don't know enough about this particular disease. And so I think they're, they're struggling with not knowing what the, what the right information is and who the right... Um, <laughs> Uh, narrators are of that information. And so I think that that's sort of, uh, as Dylan said, that's that's a concern. I mean, that's a sort of a developmental uh, issue with adolescents in any case. Uh, and that need for belonging is, is ever present for young people. Uh, and of course, social distancing exacerbates that need. Uh, and it, and Katie, let, let, me, let, let me just, just for a second, because um, you talked about communication rather than and sharing information. Given the, the circumstances that you just described, uh, what might those young individuals be more likely to listen to? Yeah. Uh, and this, this is a question for all of you, right? I mean, to think about you know, uh, your, your specific populations. If you are someone under, you know, living under those circumstances or you're a young person, who are you, you know, more likely to listen to? Yeah, it, I mean, very often you're you're likely to listen to young people, to other young people. Uh, I was on a webinar yesterday with young people from across the country, and one of the things that they were talking about a lot, which uh, is interesting because I think it um, it illuminates a tension that we have in the field a bit. They were the young people that were on the webinar that I was on yesterday were all sheltering um, individually in their um, in their homes. Uh, most of them um, are HIV positive. Uh, most of them were homeless before they were placed in these apartments, and so they were alone. Uh, and but they had access to the internet, uh, and they had pretty stable access to the internet. And so that's how they were on the webinar with us. And one of the things that they all said was they are really appreciating when they're when people that they've worked with in the past, their social workers, are reaching out to them and calling them. And that's a tension that I think we have in the field sometimes. We you know self determination, and we don't want to. Um, over, you know, contact people and get all of in their business, but all of them talked about having healthcare providers contact them, text them or to remind them about taking their medications, uh, contact them just to say like, hey, I'm still thinking about you, I'm, I'm worried about you. And so that was an interesting um, component that they added. They, they definitely are using social media a lot to get information 
uh, and in some cases that's been awesome. Like they're having access to artists and you know folks that they don't normally have access to. And in other cases, of course, they're getting this information. Um, yeah, locally, my best understanding uh, from talking to the folks at Ozone House is that most of the young people don't have much access to um, a, like a very uh, a workable cell phone or internet access. They've often got that by going to public places and using public wireless. And so that there, there's, a, there's a big disconnect there uh, and a real issue for young people to get the information that they need. Um, and then the other piece is just this general, I think you mentioned this, Dylan, and you did too, Jerry, there's a general lack of structure to our lives now. <laughs> And so remembering to take your medication, you're remembering to do your meditation or contact your work or whatever it is, is harder to do. I mean, I think we all are, are struggling with that. And, and that's exacerbated if you're in a chaotic environment, if you are trying to find safety, you're, free, you're, you're fleeing from violence. Um, and then of course, when you do that, when you do flee from violence, which is a smart choice often, then there's a, there's a whole lot of stigma around, well, why aren't you why aren't you, you know, sheltering in place and doing the thing that the governor said? So, so there's a lot of tensions, I'd say, around what is the right choice for folks to make and then what level of exploitation are they facing by staying at home or by leaving home? And there's just not as much of a safety net as there was. And most places are closed. The, um, you know, shelters are open, but most of the kind of drop-in places are closed. Um, and then, you know, family members or fictive kin, you know, community members who you might have dropped in and gotten a meal from, they don't have meals either. You know, they're struggling now too. Everybody's lost their job. And so th this kind of cascading effect on young people that we're seeing is really, um, you know, contributing to a lot of sort of negative um, experiences for them. And then those, most of the young people that I knew were, had experienced complex trauma. So that, this is just sort of getting exacerbated now. And not having as many outlets to manage it, I think has um, added to the difficulties. At some point, I'll try to say something optimistic. Well, it's, it's very good to be optimistic, but also to be realistic. Uh, there is a question that came out. Uh, I don't think that it needs to be Dylan. Uh, I think I'm gonna actually move to David for a moment because uh, HIV has come up a couple of times and you do research uh, with young people related to HIV prevention and many other things. Uh, if you could, you know, bring those things together for us. Uh, the question in the box is when people, when the parents have COVID, so what happens to the kids? What happens to, to the young people? I, I, you don't need to answer that question, David, but if there's anything you'd like to, to talk about that. I'm calling on you more than anything is because I, you know, I um, brought up HIV and Katie also brought up HIV and it's been brought up many times during our conversation. So if you'd like to make a comment related to that, but let us know who you are first. Yeah, hi, good, good afternoon, everyone. David Cordova. I am a faculty here in the School of Social Work at uh, University of Michigan. So it's a pleasure to be here with you on this Zoom call this afternoon. And, um, you know, a lot of my experience uh, currently working with youth really resonates with what Katie was saying in terms of uh, the youth's desire to have that, you know, that human connection. Um, so it's, currently I'm working on an intervention that consists of a, a mobile health uh, aspect to it. And part of that also includes a, um, a clinician initiated uh, risk reduction and prevention encounter where uh, in addition to the mobile health app, the youth have an opportunity to engage with, uh, with clinicians at a youth-centered uh, community health clinic. And so uh, since, since COVID happened, uh, the youth have been extremely responsive, whereas in the past, we've had uh, you know, additional barriers and challenges to uh, keeping the youth engaged. And so in terms of just sending out text messages or making follow-up calls for their follow-up assessments, Prior to COVID, it was much more challenging, and now these youth really look forward to these encounters. Um, and actually, are you know, there's much more back and forth texting going on between uh, research staff. And um, to date, so far, you know, we've had like 100% retention rate since COVID um, with follow-up assessments at three and six months. So it, you know, it speaks to that desire that, um, that Katie was mentioning 
um, as well as Dylan in, in terms of just, you know, feeling, wanting to feel connected in that camaraderie. Um, so. David, has, have you heard anything, uh, and then after David and me, anybody else who wants to talk about this? So uh, one of the major uh, issues with HIV prevention is teaching young people uh, who are at very high risk for infection uh, to be cautious about the kind of sexual activities that they have. Uh, and so for 30 years, we have been uh, encouraging young people to wear a condom, uh, but basically not really giving them any directives about everything else that they can do, right? Uh, there's a very clear message about wearing condoms. Here, here and there, there might be a message about uh, dental dams for oral sex. Uh, but COVID is something that you can't be kissing and getting close to someone, right? Which is something that human beings like to do, but particularly young people. Uh, and that's what puts them at risk for HIV, right? I mean, the, wanting to be proximal and wanting to engage in very intimate uh, connections. Uh, and so I wondered if anyone has uh, a comment about this or if you, David, have uh, you know, heard of you know, how young people are dealing with the fact that you know, they have been taught to prevent HIV, uh, but now they cannot have all the things that they had before, right, in terms of the physical proximity. Uh, I, I think that a lot of the mental health issues that we are seeing coming about comes from uh, you know, feeling in many ways deprived of physical uh, connection, right? I mean, I'm not even saying like sexual connection, but like physical, hugging, shaking hands. It's something that we, we you know, we, we do all the time. Uh, so I just wondered if, if you guys have heard anything on those lines. Uh, I would just say to add to that, um, I mean, the, this, what you're talking about a little bit, Rogerio, is, um, is harm reduction and, and using a harm reduction approach. And it's a really tough, complex question with regard to COVID. The, uh, and, and I don't think we have enough guidance yet about what, what would make a good harm reduction intervention when we think about uh, the coronavirus and COVID because we don't know enough. And so I do think there's a lot of mixed messages out there, like you just sort of, you know, illuminated around um, what, what, how should we be? <laughs> what is the best way to do it? And we can't, you know, abs an abstinence only policy generally hasn't worked for really any, <laughs> any issue that we've seen and so how do we how do we manage that now how do we what do we think about abstinence in the age of covid well and, and and parents who sometimes may have been communicating poorly with their kids uh now you know communicating poorly again uh but also because they are themselves uh starved for, for connection they are grieving the losses of their parents they're grieving the losses of you know uh, even if it is not very proximal, you know, grieving the losses that we have all seen over the past several weeks. Uh, and, and what's inspiring me to say this is what, you know, Beth Sherman put in the, in the chat box, which I'm going to give it to her to answer her own question about, you know, parents uh, who are sick uh, are worrying about their parents who are sick, some of them essential workers. Uh, and who are dealing with grief. Uh, so give us a little more, Beth, about you know, your thoughts on this. Um, I, think, I think part of it came up when um, a couple of weeks ago when we had, um, I think he was a pastor from um, Baton Rouge who was saying that one of the things that he's thinking about is um, when he, you know, he was sort of thinking ahead in terms of what mm. is some of his work going to be. I mean, his work is now, but going to be. And he just talked a lot about unresolved grief. I mean, how, how since we can't, there have been ways that we haven't been able to grieve, like some of the mechanisms for grieving have been impossible. There haven't been the funerals there. I mean, there have, but so I guess I, I'm, I, I was very um, struck by that and then had to think about that, particularly with children of that, um, helping kids with grief when they can't participate in, in some of the ritualized aspects and the comfort. Um, uh, a family, a family member of mine, um, a young person passed away from um, COVID and uh, it, it's a long story, but her, 
her relatives were really talking about how they were just sitting at home by themselves and that it was unimaginable that their 20 year old daughter had died and that they were sitting alone at home. And so I think about them obviously. And, but then I also think about, you know, the siblings of, of the 20 year old who like, how will they grieve her when it's such a difficult time in general and some of the distractions from grief or some of the ways that kids process grief aren't present. I mean, there's no school, there's no, so, I don't, I don't, I don't, um, I just think also this is not about grief, but like with my son, we had done a lot of talking about um, like being careful in terms of COVID-19 and taking care of himself. And he has asthma. So he's, he had heard and we, had, you know, he was very, he's very concerned. How old is your son, Beth? He's, um, he's 13. And it took like four weeks and, and my older daughter to find out from him, like he was becoming petrified about going outside at all. And he's a, you know, he's a tough little, you know, he's, he's a little, I, I mean, it was very, he's, he doesn't usually pre, pre, present with much vulnerability. So it was more coming out in sort of rage, frankly, and, um, you know, disdain for us, even encouraging him to go outside. But finally his sister, thank goodness, found out that he thought that everybody that got COVID died. So for him, you know, COVID was a death sentence, which I know for a lot of people it is, but I, it was very important to, I didn't realize that in talking with him about it, that we hadn't broken it down for him, that it is dangerous. And, but it's not, I mean, his idea was that the second you got it, you got it, you just, you know, passed away. So um, I don't know, I guess in my message there is um, as much as I feel like we're, we have conversations, just it's so important to just really find out what the kids are worrying about because it's not always going to be obvious. So Beth, I also, I mean, we, you know, you're talking about a very specific type of grief, which is the grief of somebody dying, right? Yeah. Uh, but we also grieve people getting sick. And I think that what a lot of people are doing, uh, both uh, young and, and old, uh, is grieving, all, you know, mourning the things that we have lost sure. due to COVID-19, right? Like a very specific thing I think about with the youth too is just loss of the ability, to, like, I think social, you know, social, kids are very much connected socially, but a lot of the ways that kids do also connect is like through um, sports, you know, through through, it's not always, I mean, I've noticed this again, uh, not to belabor my son, but I mean, his primary mode of communication is, I was thinking about when Rogerio was talking like this physical, you know, like competition and, you know, pushing each, like sports basically. And so just kind of dealing with the, lo the loss and the pent up feel, like the inability to have that kind of an outlet that's sort of saying, well, you know, go outside and shoot some baskets. It's not the point. It's about that physical connection. And uh, it's a whole way that kids are with each other that is not uh, so natural just always to be taught. I mean, it's not like it's natural for adults either to be just talking with each other on these screens that 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 play and that is is very difficult, I think, for it not to be there to the extent that it is not all kids play, but so I want to, uh, you know, based on what Beth is saying, uh, I'm going, you know, to ask you a question in two seconds, Todd, uh, to pick up on the whole thing of maltreatment of children and young people. Because I think that when, you know, adults are grieving and they are feeling bad about themselves, uh, they are worried about the future, uh, they are... Uh, you know, worried about, you know, what are they going to do the next day? Are they going to be having a job? So all of those things, you know, we know are preconditions for, you know, for people to lash out, right? Uh, people who already have a tendency to be violent may become even more if they feel vulnerable, if they feel all those things. And one of the ways that they uh, behave uh, in some ways is to is to deny reality and then lash out, right? So I wonder what's going on in terms of adults who might be more prone to actually engage in maltreatment and abuse. Uh, and, and particularly, I mean, so I'm, I'm looking at, at, you know, I, I, most of the people uh, I'm imagining, I mean, clearly here on the screen, living in Arbor or, or, or Detroit, 
but we, we live in, 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 with a lot of space around us. But having been someone from a city, I grew up in a city of three million people, and I lived in a building that had about like 500 people living in there, uh, probably more people than in my entire street. You know, in, this is a building of six stories. Uh, and in thinking of New York City and more urban places like Detroit, uh, where uh, you really don't have a lot of choices as to, you know, that are not enough parks, that are not enough things to do uh, normally. And now even those things have been closed uh, to, to many of us. So, and I wondered how, how those things come together, if, if, they, are, if they do, uh, to conspire uh, against, you know, children and young people who might be uh, more neglected and more uh, mistreated uh, as, a, as, a, as a result of that. Yeah, thank you, Roger. And I, by way of introduction, I'll just say uh, real briefly that I started the field in the field uh, a couple of decades ago as a psychotherapist working with kids and families and then moved on to, to spend the next two, uh, actually two and a half decades doing research and now really doing more related to uh, policy and systems level change and thinking about the ways to make systems uh, more conducive to the, the health and well-being of, of young people. And so in thinking, and, and Roger, I appreciate the, the question just about the ways in which young people and families really are vulnerable to the effects of what we're currently uh, seeing. And, uh, you know, my thoughts have really been around not only what is the impact on families, but then how are systems responding or not responding in some cases, in many cases, right, to the needs of, of vulnerable young people. Um, so to speak directly to your question, and then I'll kind of get at the systems piece, piece because I think it's important to have it be part of this. Um, I, I mean, the, the evidence is very clear that, that uh, families are suffering uh, and that kids uh, who were already vulnerable are now even more vulnerable. Uh, to the effects of, of stress on families. Uh, so, uh, you know, interestingly, reports to uh, Child Protective Services across the country are, are down, uh, indicating that there's, there, you know, are fewer reports coming in. Uh, and, and most of us uh, would argue that that's not a reflection on, uh, you know, kids being safer, but actually reports being less frequently made uh, by uh, people in school settings, coaches, counselors, teachers. I was um, at for one second. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? I was happy for, happy one, for second. one second. Imagine, oh my God, maybe COVID has changed things, but of course it is absolutely true. Go on. Yeah. So, you know, the surveillance piece is, is being impacted, right, in a negative way so that we know less about what's actually happening in families. But, you know, the research on the other side clearly says that families, you know, when they're under extreme stress and, and particularly those living in conditions, Rogeria, like you were describing, where neighborhood density is what it is and poverty is what it is, you know, end up, uh, you know, experiencing the, the stress in, in more significant ways and suffering as a result. Uh, and the, the, the lack of resources available in resource or in uh, communities, uh, you know, and, and in systems serving kids and families obviously contribute to the, the hardship that, that many uh, encounter. So, I mean, the story is bleak, I think, all around, uh, but the, I think the upside of it is, is that the kind of the resilient side of the, th you know, and protective factor side of the conversation, you know, suggests that there's a lot that can be done from policy all the way down to practices and systems. And so, you know, people like Beth and, and I and others think about, you know, the ways to make schools, for example, more trauma informed and, and you know, resilience focused. And I think that there's a lot of hope there. I mean, I, I think that there is, reason to believe that we can actually transform systems, uh, given the political will uh, to do so, to, to make them more responsive uh, to young people, uh, and to find ways to better support families. So they're kind of, you know, exemplars that come out of uh, some of the work around schools that suggest that community-oriented schools, or community schools as they're called, you know, can, can actually have real effects on, on uh, families, that families receive services more frequently, uh, more, you know, more aligned with what they're looking for and the kids uh, benefit as a result of that. So, um, you know, the same is true in child welfare. I think that the, to the extent that child welfare becomes more responsive, uh, you know, earlier to families who are in need of support uh, and resources, the better off the kids are. Um, and there are some, you know, experiments that are happening across the country and actually globally, uh, other parts of the, of the world that are suggesting that, that community-based uh, embedded child welfare uh, strategies actually can make a, a real difference uh, in uh, low-income and under-resourced communities. So 
that's the positive side. You know, that, that from a policy level down to the practice side, there, there are some things that actually can be done. And there's some examples of the ways in which communities can rally around uh, vulnerable families and actually improve the health of kids. Well put, Todd. I, I'm reading also, you know, in, in relationship to what, you know, you just said, I mean, Trina placed, um, a, you know, like a, a, a nice list of systems that we have in place in regular times that, we, that help children, that help families stay together. It protects us in some ways, right? But I think what uh, Todd has made it very, you know, brought to the surface very nicely uh, and, and now confirmed by Trina is that when those systems you know, are no longer functioning the way they, they, they usually do, uh, it creates further vulnerabilities for those who are already you know, vulnerable. Uh, and young people, um, of course, particularly urban poor young people uh, are very vulnerable regardless of COVID-19, but they are now even more. So what I would like to do as we move toward, you know, we still have uh, quite a few moments to go through, you know, which is good. Uh, but I would like for us to engage a little bit uh, in some kind of like some free association uh, is what I'm going to try to do here today because we, we touched upon so many things, right? Uh, and, and every time that I'm listening to one of you, in my mind, there's a, a, a couple of voices. And the voices are asking me, well, so many people are already, you know, so sick, sick of COVID-19. And what is it that they are going to be doing next week or in another two weeks or in another two months? The other voice inside of my head is the voice uh, of, well, we don't know exactly what it is that's going to happen. We maybe go back to school on, on, in September. Uh, you know, maybe we can go back to theaters and watch beautiful plays, maybe, you know, next January. And this is giving me, you know, panic, where it's almost like my life is going to be on pause much longer than I thought two months ago, three months ago. So uh, I'm just going to throw this to, you know, to everyone who is, uh, you know, here today, not only, you know, the panelists. Uh, what's going on inside of your head? And, and I'm doing this also because uh, I am winding down uh, the COVID-19 discussions uh, where today we are talking about young people. I'm planning to have another two of the sessions. And then at the end of, the, in, at the end of May, I'm going to take a break. Um, we may come back to it. Uh, we may not come back to it, uh, but I will be taking a break at the end of May. So I will be inviting people for the next couple of weeks to talk about specifically people who are in jail and people who are in prison, uh, because I think it's a very specific population that uh, to me and, and immigrants in concentration camps, I mean, those are populations that I feel if, we, if nothing happens for them, uh, it's, it's almost like, you know, keeping them, you know, between walls to die, right? I mean, it, it's, there is no other way to, to look at it. So that also is uh, making me exasperated when I, when, I, when, I, when I think about those things, right? And the other population which came up a week ago is about people who are in recovery and people who are not necessarily in recovery, who are actively using drugs. Uh, they may not necessarily be good for them. And, and I think we need to talk about that, that, that population as well. Uh, so going back to the, the, the free association piece, uh, does anyone would, you know, does anyone want to share maybe, you know, like a free association, like wh what's the thing that you are thinking back here, not the things that you are talking about? Should I call on someone or should I just let you guys, um, Free association, anybody can be free. Let me go to Eddie, because I haven't he heard from you, Eddie. Is that all right? Yes, that's fine. Um, so I guess um, I've been thinking a lot, or maybe I guess um, in, coming into my mind a lot in the background is just somewhat similar to you, um, just how to navigate all of this uncertainty. Like, I think I'm going about my days, um, you know, 
being as present as I can, doing my meetings, um, you know, those types of things. But I feel like so many, uh, you know, it's, it's just very uncertain how things are going to play out. And then on the other hand, I think, you know, so much has changed. And then as we were just talking about, we're seeing so many um, inequities, um, so many disparities. And yet in some ways, we're still you know, in my back of the, my mind, I'm thinking you're still kind of just going about like the daily routine mm-hmm. and all of this is like happening. And so how do, you know, kind of reconciling, being at home, um, kind of doing what I need to do to get through the day, but still um, kind of these bigger picture concerns. And honestly, sometimes I get really concerned just about the state of our democracy in the future. And I Try not to like, yeah, I, I could really spiral on that. And I try. Yeah. To, um, so I guess that's just some of the things that kind of pop into the back of, of my head um, in the last little bit of time here. Thank you, Eddie. I mean, the, the moment you said that, I mean, I thought of, you know, the whole thing in Wisconsin yesterday um, where the Supreme Court of the state, you know, basically liberated, you know, people from going and doing whatever it is that they wanted to do. And, and literally in about an hour, uh, the bars were packed and places were packed. And I'm, I'm sure you guys saw on television as well that they are changing some policies in Florida because the beaches are just like packed with people. Uh, so so uh, the state of the, our democracy, I, I saw a picture of, I think it was Facebook one, you know, somewhere uh, where the person had the flag the flag and, and a sign, I think, together. And I'm not going to re- remember exactly what it said, but, but I think that there is a, 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 a mentality that if you become safe or if you engage in behavior that will make all of us safe, there's, there's a, a feeling of one's losing one's liberty. Right? I mean, it's like I am no longer free of someone's freedom. I am no longer free if I if I am safe or if I allow other people uh, to be safe. Um, it, it, it just, you know, reminds of some of the, 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 the other conversations that we had, you know, weeks past, uh, some of them Brad actually brought up. So when I said, um, you know, free association, you popped back on Brad. Uh, do you want to share a free association with us? <laughs> you know, I just, I keep, I keep seeing a lot. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yes, yeah, fine. You know, I, I keep seeing these activities through a, through a, through a racialized lens and the, this, this notion of, of eugenics, you know, to me that, you know, the leadership of this country is again, as I was speaking a couple, you know, a couple of weeks ago, you know, every time I hear somebody say something like, you know, I, I can't understand why the leadership or why the, the, the actions are are being are being taken there's no rational explanation for why there's inaction or why people are not caring um you know about vulnerable other people and you know to me it comes back to the either an in either a conscious or an unconscious internalization of uh you know of of a belief in this in the um, in the in the social in social selectivity mm-hmm. that you know to you know you know to put the don't tread on me flag out in the front of the house is a way of saying i want to retain my liberties but the messaging behind that is also um, you know, it, it, to me, it communicates a sense of, well, if people are going to die, if people are not going to, to survive this, it's meant to be because they're old, because they're vulnerable, because they are not of the, the pure ideology, the purest ideology. And that, to me, that frightens me. Um, you know, sort of tapping on to, you know, Addie, what you, what you were talking about. Yeah, the, you know, the elimination of our democracy, it, 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 to me, is made even worse by either a conscious choice or unconscious movement towards, towards eugenics. 
that also means, though, that um, the selectivity comes in waves, right? Uh, because the selectivity is not quite real. Uh, it's not biological. The selectivity is racial. Uh, and it's social, and it, and right. it is uh, you know about something else. So the, the initial belief uh, is out of ignorance that you know because it comes out of not understanding that the selectivity is is social. The selectivity is not biological, right? So and yet, and yet you you still have scientists today in the twenty first century who are still trying to conduct studies to demonstrate ah oh, there must be some genetic there still is some genetic explanation um, for, for racial disparities. Um, you know, e even though we can say it's debunked, there are still people making efforts to, to, uh, to investigate that question. I mean, I suspect that the same way that those people investigating those things is because there's a, um, a corner of the market uh, we need to read and pay to read it. Uh, so that's why they exist. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, because it is, I mean, it, it, it's based on, on on the capitalistic idea that you can make money doing anything you want. Uh, so if, so long as there is a consumer for whatever those ideas are. Mm -hmm. uh, 20, I, just, yeah, tw I just say, tw I mean, 20 years ago, it was Charles Murray and the bell curve. And, you know, today you can, I mean, re read, um, oh, Ibrahim's uh, Superior uh, a a as a way to see really articulate description of, of um, you know, research continuing to move in that way. Which is unfortunate. Uh, I see people having like a, you know, a, a bunch of discussions going on. Uh, you know, it feels like going to the therapist, like the whole syndrome of, you know, opening the door, you know, when you're going home. And then, of course, oh, my God, now I have a hundred questions and things that I want to tell my therapist. Um, so I, I would like to encourage those conversations to keep going outside of these meetings. Uh, I think these meetings have been incredible and the, the attendance has been so wonderful. But I don't want you to, to go today without acknowledging all the conversations happening in there. Uh, Chris reminding us about, you know, immigrants uh, and the situation that they live today on the very, you know, imagine the fear of being confined anywhere and not, you know, and not having control of what it is that you can do for your own safety. Uh, it doesn't, you know, it's not only immigrants, any situation where you feel confined and you have no, no, no better ways to, 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 to live your life. The other one also has to do here about uh, the idea of privilege uh, and, and even when it, when it comes to how uh, young people have sometimes more and less privilege. But I think that that also speaks to what Eddie was talking about. It's like the, the, the conversation back here is, a lot of losses, and, and, but my life has not changed completely because of COVID-19. There's, there's a semblance of repetition every day, but basically I'm, I'm pretty safe, right? And I think many of us are, although uh, we have had several people uh, who came to these conversations who themselves had COVID-19, many got very sick, uh, and thank God they, they survived. Uh, but there is that feeling, even if you don't feel extremely safe, one feels that by comparison, you know, talking about the social line, right? I mean, by comparison, one feels safer than others. And that's part of the conversation that's going on uh, in the back of one's head. Uh, so I, I encourage those conversations to, to keep going. Uh, but I wanna thank uh, my, my panel my wonderful colleagues and friends who came and specifically spoke about young people. Uh, there are many questions. We never end those conversations with a lot of answers. We end them with more questions than answers. But I think that we are creating an incredible uh, documentation um, in, you know, in real time of the things that we see. And I think that Beth, um, wants to say something before we oh, go. All that I wanted to say is that I was struck today, maybe other weeks too, about how wonderful it is that we have students from our program here. Yes, many. And um, so I just wanted, I, I had, I think I maybe had been oblivious to that before, but I just wanted to say how much I appreciate that this is a real community of learners. Yes, and it been beautifully mixed uh, with staff, uh, faculty, 
and, and people from other cities. I mean, I, I know a lot of people here that I'm looking at, like people from New York who keep, keep, keep coming and from New Orleans. And so we are having a very nice national conversation. So uh, thank you all for being here today. Uh, and thank you all, um, my Faculty Alliance for Diversity colleagues uh, for being here and for making this uh, possible. So until next week, uh, I'm not sure if we are going to be talking about um, confined spaces, uh, you know, prison, jails, etc., or uh, issues related to substance use and misuse. Uh, but one of the two things that you should know in the next couple of days. Thank you so much. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Rogerio. Mm -hmm. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Thank you. Thank you.